Hi there, everybody, and welcome to a very exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I am told this is a musical edition. Is that right? Yes, we're going to be Kevin singing Dooley. throughout this entire thing. You're going to be singing too, Jason. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you're here. It's so great to see you. Thanks for the Green Lantern shirt. Hey, if they can do it on Star Trek, we can do it on here. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I got my crazy How Jordan t-shirt. And There's some goes. parallax there. <laughs> yeah. Now that's that's pre-parallax. That's the the issue before he um went parallax at issue number 49. Oh yes, uh, yes. But anyway, I also have my um I have on hand in case I and in case I need to do a costume change. <laughs> I do have my uh my Kyle uh -huh, Kyle nice. Rainer uniform at the ready. At the ready. Love it. We can go from from Hal to Kyle at any moment. Right. I, if uh, to do the Aquaman one, I guess I'm just going to have to. Well, no, no, I won't do that. <laughs> well, we were just saying, and I'm going to put this out there on YouTube and Spotify and different places. Uh, we were talking musicals and our love of musicals, literature. We both have English teaching in our lives. Uh, and we were talking about a potential Aquaman musical starring Jason Momoa. And I think Duke could pull it off. That last yeah. scene uh, in Aquaman. Um, Oh, what is it? The Lost Kingdom? The one that just Lost came Kingdom, out? Lost Kingdom, right. Yeah, I think, you know, he could bring the rocker aesthetic, sort of like Russell Crowe did with Les Mis. I mm -hmm. think that could totally work. Well, there is a um, uh, a commercial mm -hmm. that has him um, singing. It's for T-Mobile, I think, and he's mm -hmm. singing with two of the guys from Scrubs. Yes, yes, and, I've uh, seen he's that. And he's got a pair of lungs on him. He yeah, does. He's got a pair of lungs on him. He does. He does. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good shape. Good shape. Um, yes. Well, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not as nice to look at as Jason Momoa, but glad to be talking with you on this episode. And I know no, that that's this not is what our your wife said. Time. That's not what your wife said. That I'm not as good looking as Jason Momoa. No, no, that uh, you, you, Jason Momoa, she'll go for you. Every oh, time. oh, that's that is too sweet. That is too sweet. <laughs> Yes, yes. It's a it's a Jason thing. It's it's yeah. the Jason Club, I believe. Exactly. Uh, well, for folks out there that don't know you, my goodness, they should. Right? I mean, you've edited Green Lantern, Justice League Europe. You've written uh, Green Arrow, both greens there. You've written uh, Mr. Miracle. We talked a good bit about Mr. Miracle the last time we were talking. And, and you've had these amazing collaborations. You've written Aqua or edited Aquaman, sorry, uh, and the Spectre as well, one of my favorite runs of the Spectre. And so you've been in the world of comics and in the world of teaching and uh, now musicals. I mean, uh, a man of the arts. Exactly, exactly. I, and I enjoy, enjoy them. I mean, creativity, The um, it's uh, we can get into the semi politics of the fact that so many of the arts are being uh, cut from many of our schools, which is which is very sad, uh, very sad. And it, it should be. I mean, I I also taught theater. Um, I not only taught English, but I also taught theater when I was uh, teaching middle school. I taught um, theater for both high school and middle school and i taught theater history as well and uh that was a, a lot of fun we put on you know tiny little snippets of plays um little scenes little vignettes but yeah the arts i mean comic book is it's all the great parts of the arts it's writing it's character it's um uh, it's art itself it's mm -hmm. it it combines a lot of the only thing you don't have is the actual uh, audio, which I don't know about you when you were a kid. I used to read, uh, my brother used to read comics to me aloud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you ever read any of the comics aloud? I have actually. I was teaching uh, Superman Birthright this past mm -hmm. semester in American literature. It was uh, kind of a fun thing to do to get to tackle American literature through, you know, the Superman angle. And uh, I was reading aloud a, a good bit and doing different voices for different characters. And, and it's Excellent. interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of fun with it. It's interesting to, to get those wordless panels and then to get the sound effects and all of the different aspects of it. Do you remember those records that came with the comic book? 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I do. And the you cassettes. Do. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the bagged books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, these were, I remember, they were actually records, 45s, that uh, yeah. had um, uh, comic books attached to it. And you would, uh, at the end of every page, it would say, do something like, or some <laughs> sort of sound effect for you to turn the page. And I, I had a lot of those. Those are probably yeah. collectibles now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the the teacher trick that I have for reading a wordless panel is sometimes I would just stop and take it in. But then I would also kind of do the think aloud, you know, the think aloud strategy of like, oh, I'm seeing this. Oh, look at that. The next panel. Oh, my goodness. That's totally I would just keep running my mouth while I was reading it to to kind of great. capture That's the great. literary things. Uh, so, yeah. And film film based sort of things that mm-hmm. happen in those books, too. My brother. Um, who is a professor, he taught at UCLA, taught at um, Loyola Marymount, and um, also at Art Center in Pasadena. He taught a a class, Comics as Literature. Love it, love it. Mm -hmm. And I knew uh, another wonderful person, uh, Charles Hatfield at uh, CSUN, Mm -hmm. who taught um, not only Comics as Literature, but he taught uh, Jack Kirby. Yeah. Just yeah. Jack Kirby. And so he uh, brought me in since I um, had not only edited Mr. Miracle, but also wrote Mir- Mr. Miracle and met Jack. He had me as a, as a guest. So, yeah, this whole comic book thing just might catch on. It really might. It really might. Yeah. If only they would do movies or something like that, they could really they could they do can't a translate thing. that stuff to movies. They really can't. They really can't. Not quite the same way. Yeah. Um, Charles Hetfield has that great book about Jack Kirby. Hand of Fire, yeah. I think is what it's called or something. Yeah, like I think that. so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look it up. Yes, yeah. Well, you have uh, this history uh, as a writer, as an editor. What's it like at, at this point to have made this impact on comics and to have been there through these moments in, especially DC Comics history? It, it's very interesting because just today I was on... Um, this uh, on this facebook thing mm-hmm. and um the, somebody asked who's your favorite superhero and i put down green lantern yeah and the person asked me why and i said oh because i read it as a kid it had to do with imagination it had to do with um um you know coming up with stuff um from your imagination as well as as willpower which made him different than other characters. And um, I said, I also edited Green Lantern for five years at DC. Mm-hmm. And the guy said, um, I, I said, uh, also I helped, you know, create uh, Kyle Rayner. Mm-hmm. And this is, uh, I don't know how, when I left, I left DC in 1999. And this guy, just this long passage of how, oh my God, Kyle fans, they're real. They're <laughs> out there. You left such a legacy. Mm-hmm. And um, I said, oh, but that I felt honored to know that that it's that it's still going on and that people still realize that there was an impact that I did indeed leave an impact uh, at DC uh, with the characters, the characters that people still love. I'm, I'm very glad about that. And um I mean, if there was one thing uh, that I hope that I impacted is that that I did care about the characters and as stories, as characters, and that you can twist things, you can do the unexpected. Uh, we, I think we talked in our last um, talk about how much uh, people got upset with me because of what we did with uh, Green Lantern. And yet sales went up. Yeah. And um, it, it, it is all about the character. And that if there's anything legacy, if there is a legacy that I wish to have left is that you stay true to the character and you can do anything. And if you surprise people, then they'll come back. Uh, they'll yeah. still, because why? Because they care. Yeah. Because they care about the character. I mean, I am a huge Hal Jordan fan. And mm-hmm. I cared about Hal Jordan. And with what we did about Green Lantern, 
with Green Lantern, uh, I hope I showed that, although people disagreed with me, I hope I showed that I did care about the character of Green Lantern and even about how uh, later on. I mean, I edited Green Lantern before we did uh, Emerald Twilight. Yeah. And I mean, hey, I happen to have right here at my fingertips my favorite run. Very nice. Of yeah. Oh, yeah. Green, Lantern, Green Arrow by uh, the fabulous uh, Denny O'Neill and mm -hmm. uh, Neil Adams. I mean, that is, this is, that is golden right there. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I read started reading Green Lantern back in the 50s. And uh, yeah, I, I always care about character and that's what comics is. It's not about necessarily about superheroes. Mm -hmm. It's not about uh, anything else other than character and you caring about these characters. And that's that's what I hope I, I've left is that people realize that I did indeed care about these characters. Uh, uh, well, we were talking about To Kill a Mockingbird before this, so I'm going to do mm -hmm. a, a little comparative thing here of like, you know you love a character when they make a decision that you don't like and you're still, you're rooting for them and you want them to come back. And that's kind of the Hal Jordan Parallax thing for me. And I, I won't spoil anything, but for folks that haven't read it, he goes through a rough time. We'll just say that. Um yeah. There was the, have you read the sequel to To Kill a Mockingbird, which I suppose was the sort of prequel? Yep, right there. Uh, to Set a Watchman? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? I did. But, you know, they do this thing with Atticus Finch where they make him human. Mm -hmm. And so there were people that read that and didn't really care for that as much. And I found myself going, but Atticus, you're human now. Whereas in To Kill a Mockingbird, he was, you know, kind of this paragon of virtue and seen through a child's eyes. But it's really interesting when you love a character enough to let them take a journey and then want them to come back in some way from that too. The wanting to come back is always an interesting uh, idea because in comics, it always seemed like, of course, there's the old saying that heroes can't die, that mm -hmm. they'll <laughs> always come back. It was a rule that you, if if a character dies, he's not really dead unless you see the body, mm -hmm. that, um, that there's no magic involved. <laughs> so there was like three or four uh, rules to know if a person is really be dead and they bring him back anyway. And it, yeah. And it has to do with continuity. Are you a big continuity um, Maven fan? I used to be for for a very small amount of time. But I'm also the kind of kind of reader who could take like the Michael Keaton Batman and the Adam West Batman, and they could be friends. They could be the same person in my mind. So mm -hmm. I mean, there's a point that I've gotten to where I sort of appreciate the different strands of what you can do with stories. And I was a big Elseworlds fan too. Um, yes. So, so that part of it, I mean, there are these parts of characters that live on, but to think of it as all one big kind of, I'm going to borrow the flash metaphor. I'm sorry, the spaghetti ball, okay. um, you know, to think of it as all of that sort of woven together. I don't, I don't love the characters any less for that. I don't think. Well, it's uh, interesting. You sit, brought up Elseworlds because Denny O'Neill, um, he described Elseworlds as taking the essence of a character mm -hmm. and putting them into uh, different venues mm -hmm. or different environments. So Batman will always be Batman, but like I did in Elseworlds of Batman as if he got the ring. Yeah. The ring, the ring mm -hmm. by um, Mike Barr and Jerry Bingham. Jerry Bingham. Oh my gosh. I love Jerry. He's a fat, all oh, fantastic painted cover for that book oh, oh yeah God. and you're talking oh. batman and darkest night which is one of my yes. favorite elseworld stories yeah yes oh so wonderful so wonderful but um again to uh not switch gears but to talk about changes in characters mm -hmm. um when peter david was writing aquaman i mean in the second issue we we have aquaman who got his arm chewed off. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that, oh my gosh, we got 
so many letters. So I, I had to, I had to fight for that. I had to fight <laughs> wow. for that going up because Peter suggested it. And I go, okay, let me take this upstairs. And I took it upstairs to Paul Levitz and Paul Levitz was against it at first. And then, uh, I talked it out with him. I said, look, it's Peter David. Peter David is, uh, you know, so such a, a clever, talented, amazingly creative, innovative writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul said, OK, what are you going to do with him after that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's going to change Aquaman. But what are you going to do? Are you just going to just have him with a hook and then not do anything with it? And we... Uh, I, I talked with Peter and I brought it back to Paul. I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a hook and then it's going to be a cybernetic hook. And it's going to be his a link between him, uh, his undersea personality, or um, I guess his uh, personality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then also his, uh, earth, his land, because the hook is what, you know, catches fish. And so it's going to show his duality, which... He's always had. Yeah. yeah. And so we still have the essence of the character. And um, and then the later on, um, they didn't they do it that he had a, a water hand? Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Yeah. 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 I don't know who did that. It might have been Jeff. Jeff Johns. Yeah. I do like the hook. I like the hook. It's mm -hmm. a it's a good symbol. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it was cybernetic at, at a time. And then. Um. Yeah, it, it was all about, uh, and that's one of the legacies, uh, I, legacy, mm -hmm. uh, of of my time on Aquaman is that people I think got to expect from a Kevin Dooley book <laughs> is that is that you you can't predict what's going to happen. Yeah, and um, Mike Carlin is famous for saying that every issue is somebody's first issue and can be somebody's last issue. Mm -hmm. And so what we did with what I tried to do with my writers and my artists is to get something that is going to make people come in mm -hmm. and keep them. Yeah. All right. Cause yeah, you know, sales, you got sales for number one and number two and number three and like that. And I always remember with Green Lantern sales for issue number 50 when, you know, <laughs> gone. Yeah. Gone because sales, sales on Green Lantern were, were going down. And uh, as much as people don't like to think of it, it is indeed a, uh, a commercial medium. I don't know if that's controversial or not. I think that, you know, that's very fair to say. And I think we're also at a time where, People are sort of expanding through their Kickstarters and uh, mm -hmm. different ways of creating. So uh, I think that is definitely apropos. Um, when you think about it, I mean, when I got at DC, where did I start? I started at Justice League. Mm -hmm. I started at the Justice League that was so different. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not talking about Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, stuff like that. This was Justice League that I uh, kind of like not cut my teeth on, but that I was raised on with Andy Helfer, mm -hmm. uh, Mike, Mark DeMattis, uh, Keith Giffen, some guy named McGuire, Kevin McGuire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it uh, that's how different was that? How unique was that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, when much. they used to call it um, Pizza Night and oreos pizza and oreos mm -hmm. remember john 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 jones loved oreos <laughs> yeah. yeah and i uh, that's that's where that's where i started i go this is this is different and people kept on coming back to justice league because the characters are there but they're fighting a guy who is a decorator of of the galaxy yeah. um they're fighting uh the the injustice league mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh this is actually was the first issue that i got my name oh wow in. i gotta i gotta see if i can zoom in on it i don't know if you can read that there it is 
Kevin Dooley, King of the Universe, right there. Yep. King of the Universe. And I actually had people coming up to me at conventions and say, could you sign it, King of the Universe? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Oh, and you had uh, Rubenstein on that issue, too. I saw mm -hmm. that name. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I love Joe. Yeah. I love Joe. Joe and I went to um, a movie together with our respective uh, persons. And I forgot what the movie was. I don't think it was Titanic, but it might have been. And Joe and I were crying <laughs> so much. And our, we kept on having things being passed, you know, Kleenex being passed <laughs> to us. By our ladies, here, here's another one. Here's another. We have, we're criers. We call, oh, yeah, I love Joe. Still love Joe. Still kind of keep in touch with him on the uh, on the social media thing. Yeah. Now but, you mentioned uh, Keith Giffen a minute ago as well, mm -hmm. who I had the chance to talk with last summer, um, just a few months before he passed. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask what what your experience with him was like. Um, he would meet with. Andy Helfer in Andy's office. And as a result, Keith, Keith would get there about, you know, 10 o'clock, whenever the appointment was. And Andy would roll in at about noon. And uh, <laughs> then uh, Andy would say, okay, let's go to lunch. And um, that, um, so I got to know Keith just from sitting around and talking with him. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if anybody knows how Keith plots did you know? Have you guys seen what how he plots? Mm -hmm. Would love if you to can look up that. on the internet, I hope they have some of his pencil plotting. Just freaking amazing! He would just um, draw in blue pencil uh, the plot, huh. and then he would give that to um, both to Mark Dematis and to the artist, and so the artist would. Um, draw from the layouts. Wow. And um, he would have little bits of snippets of dialogue, which of course um, Mark DeMattis would, you know, make so uh, wonderfully characteristic, but that's what he would do. He would plot 22 pages in like a, a day. Wow. When, when, uh, but think about it also, he was doing Justice League International, Justice mm -hmm. League Europe, um, I I worked with him on on Ragman, but also uh, he was doing so much, mm -hmm. and he was just, hey, how about if we do this? But and it was just amazing that he would just sit there and just come up with this out wow. of his head, out of nowhere, and then uh, <laughs> Andy sometimes had to kind of like rein Keith in right, right. a little bit because. Uh, Keith would go with, how about if we have John Jones uh, or, or how about if we have Dr. Fate become a woman and yeah. uh, stuff like that. And uh, But there were so many times that I saw Andy, I don't think we can get away with that. I don't know. I don't <laughs> think we can get away with that. But, but Keith said, oh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> and it was great. Seriously, the um, the amount of creativity that came from this man's mind was just... Um, astounding and it, it, astounding and unstoppable uh -huh. um he and andy would get together um sometimes at andy's house and just plot the next six months of justice league international justice league europe as well as the annuals and uh and other things and it was just back and forth back and forth but keith was was just astounding with how much creativity there was constantly coming from his mind mm -hmm. and uh, being able to do that. He, he, he loved the nine panel grids yeah. on, on comics. And he always in just about every issue, I'll say in every issue, there was always one panel that looked like this. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that's how it was in the plot. Yeah. And sure. And so um McGuire would, you know, do an eye, but you know, Kevin would do it so you know, so emotionally. 
And uh, there was um, sometimes Keith didn't like fights. He didn't mm-hmm. like plotting out fights. So sometimes he would do uh, page 12 through 15. This is on a plot, okay, on a, a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, mm-hmm. white piece of paper. Page 12 through 15, fight, fight, fight. <laughs> That's it. You That's get the it. idea. <laughs> and, well, and, and then we do with the, um, and then on the next page would be with the result of uh, this is what had to happen in the fight. Uh-huh. But it was up to the artist mm. to figure out uh, how to to do it, how to choreograph it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Keith was very respectful, respectful of the artists, um, giving them the freedom to do, to tell the story. But the uh, entire story was there. Yeah. Entire story was there. I'd like to to bring up, I had the honor of working with Keith on two um, things that he created. Mm-hmm. Let's see if I can find the number ones for these. Okay. One, okay, I don't have the number one for this, but it was called Vexed. Uh-huh, uh-huh. If you have not, um, you fans out there, if you have not looked at, at Vexed, look at that, a bacteria engineered to infect the world. Wow. And Mike McCone was on this. Um, uh, he worked on The Punisher later, and he told me, that vexed was one of the favorite th- his favorite things to work on because they all expected him to be a superhero mm-hmm. uh, artist and this was vexed was the god of things unexpected mm-hmm. and it wasn't the god of mischief or the god of of unluck he was just a th- uh, but here is this is was mike mccone's favorite cover from what he told me, Mike, Mike McCone, who lived in a castle in uh, in England. And wow. um, this is something that uh, he said, I want chaos on the cover. Yeah. Chaos. Yeah. And so find vexed number five, kids. So we broke apart the, the logo. Uh-huh. And look at this. Look, just look at the insanity. Oh, wow. On this cover. That is some chaos. And we had, um, this was issue number five, and we had a contest to find all the things, all the all the catastrophes that happened on this cover. <laughs> and we were going to give them a piece of art or something like that. And uh, unfortunately, with issue number six, it was vexed, battling the one thing he can't um, defeat, low sail. <laughs> And Keith did that. Keith came up with that. Wow. He came up with that. Uh, the, um, let's see. Um, the, all, all hail the, the god of ill timed flatulence. <laughs> <laughs> there was a god of ill timed flatulence. And oh my gosh, it was. Um, I'll hold, let me see if I can find the uh, vexed uh, birth scene. It was a scene where. Um, you just see it the outside of a building, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you hear vexed mothers or somebody saying, push, push. <laughs> okay, here it is, here it is. Here it is, here's a uh, vexed mom uh-huh. getting ready to push. Okay, ready? This is Keith. This, think about this just as quick pencils. Just as quick pencils. And it was, okay, yeah, and then uh-huh. Rat, and then the kid comes flying out, <laughs> and and he flies back in. <laughs> and seriously, this is what Keith came up with. Is that Keith just said, oh, "This is what I want to do," and wow. um, it was supposedly vexed as part of the pantheon of mm-hmm. in DC comics. I don't think I've ever seen him. So just like vexed, we're out the window and back in. Right. And the other thing that Keith wanted me to edit, and I was so honored and said, hey, Kevin, I'd like you to edit this with me. One of his favorite characters was Bugs Bunny. 
And he always wanted to do Bugs Bunny somehow with Warner Brothers. <laughs> and I don't know why, but uh, Warner Brothers said we're not letting him near <laughs> our uh, our character. And so he came up with the heckler. Yes, I remember the heckler. Oh, oh yes, my God. Yes. And this, if you look through this, every page is a nine panel grid. Mm-hmm. Now, why did he like nine panel grids? He said very honestly that you get more for your money. You get more story. You get more art. And here there's there's the big um, splash page and stuff like that. But, I mean, Heckler is a you got to be invested in the Heckler. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's so complicated. It's so intricate. Um, it was um, Heath and Tom and Mary Beerbaum working with it that he also worked with on Legion of Superior. And my favorite issue of The Heckler was um, this guy right here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And what it was, he was the guy who was a guy who touched things and they turned into the exact thing like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that. And oh my gosh, so hilarious. Yeah. Every page is so hilarious. And even look at the cover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just cover blurb. And here's the opening splash page. Yeah. And yeah. why do we know this? Because <laughs> it says splash page. Uh, and Keith just went through this and every single thing was just it. Genius is, of course, thrown around really, really easily. Mm -hmm. But Keith was a genius. He was. Um, to um, the guy who was the editor of this, me, um, what I had to do was I had to type out every one of these things and paste them down. <laughs> so that was my contribution to that. That's why I love Keith. Uh, right before I left DC Comics, Keith said to me, you had better keep in touch with me mm -hmm. or I will track you down. <laughs> nice. It's like Liam Neeson in Taken. That's and right. so um, Keith was a dear man, a, a genius, true, true genius in art, in creativity, in writing. Yeah, um, and just for the person he was, he had a, a, a sarcastic mood about him. And that's why he went so well with, with Andy. I was, oh, I was Keith Giffen once. You were Keith Giffen once. Yes, there. Uh, <laughs> I can't. I don't remember. It was Saint Mark's Comics, one of the comics uh, stories that was down in the uh, the village, and Andy would bring in different people from time to time, and introduce that person as Keith Giffen. <laughs> and as we're going down, he goes, "Oh, by the way, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be Keith Giffen." I go, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about?" And they explained it to me, and I went in there, and uh, I was very, like, separate. I didn't really want to talk, and it was like that, kind of like what Keith is. He didn't mm -hmm. like too much attention. And so um, Andy said, oh, that's Keith Giffen. And, they, and at this time, they were going, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they said, are you Keith Giffen? He goes, yeah. I said, yeah. So I was very aloof. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He goes, are you really Keith Giffen? I went about uh, Legion of Superheroes, and I go, yeah, and I knew much about Keith's work, so I could answer the question they posited to me. <laughs> and uh, and I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. Wow, was that really Keith Giffen? That really... So to the point where when Andy actually brought Keith into the store, they didn't believe it was him. <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah, that, that, that was a, a, a tremendous loss to, uh, yeah. to comics. Uh, the loss of Keith. He was a, he was a great guy, great guy. Miss and miss working with him, and uh, yeah, it was cool. It was cool. Yeah, uh, seemed to be one of those people who 
always had an insight on things and always had mm. uh the wit and the humor was seemingly always intact yeah twisted 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 humor and again that comes down to um the heckler and vexed he he took it and he would and justice league he would twist things look at his time on latest superheroes he, he twisted things took a different angle and there was still respect for the characters but it was um it, it was different and kept people coming and so i must say, I, was, I gotta say that uh, a lot of my um of what i did at comics uh, i would say also came from keith keith and andy and uh, the creators that i work with so yeah but well, I, I definitely feel as though we have enough to talk about for uh, at least another chat at some point. I would, I would love oh, to do that wait. at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, don't yes. let's not forget that Keith also did did the Emerald Dawn, the Green Lantern Emerald Dawn, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he was the one. Oh, did the uh, fandom go crazy when the remember when um, Hal Jordan was um, slightly intoxicated and mm -hmm. ran into that billboard <laughs> and wound up in in jail? That was Keith. Yeah. yeah yeah great yes yes and we can so we're i know you have to go but yeah um so if, if i'm a if i'm ahead. a listener out there and i want to find out more and kind of follow up with you uh where would be the best place for listeners to connect with you i'm always on the book face mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. facebook i love uh being on facebook i answer everybody's uh questions that i can uh or as, as respectfully as I can. Um, I I love comics. I love Green Lantern. I love Hal. I love Aquaman. Everything that I worked on. Um, I I just it was just so great to be uh, at DC Comics, and I I still read comics from time to time. And um, if if somebody wants to pick up the um, Green Lantern collections. Mm -hmm. that uh, I did along with uh, Ron Mars and, and Daryl Banks. Um, that would be great. Great place to, to look yeah. for the Aquaman stuff with Peter David and uh, Marty Eglin and, and uh, Sean McLaughlin. As a matter of fact, uh, I was kinda, it was kind of cool at the end of the Aquaman, The Lost Kingdom that you and I were talking about mm -hmm. for the uh, Aquaman musical with Jason Momoa. Yes. Um, at the end, were a, a a list of and special thanks to, and I saw a lot of the creators that I worked with uh, up there in the credits. Yeah, and I felt good about the fact that wow, in a sense, I helped as an editor to mm -hmm. get their name seen and get their legacy carried on, and it'll always be it was always be on that screen. So Absolutely. I felt very honored. You know, Sean McLaughlin, Ken Hooper, P. David Marty Eglin, and and so many more. Um, that was that was that was so great. So that's that's another thing that I'm I'm grateful for that this stuff this stuff still lives on, so even though I'm an old I'm an old retired teacher. Um, <laughs> I, so I I'm on Facebook, Kevin Dooley, duh, and, and uh, yeah, I always answer questions there and. Uh, and that's about it for me. Jason, thank you for, for inviting yeah. me here again. A pleasure. A pleasure. I, I'm a teacher in the summer, so we will definitely plan another chat sometime soon. And uh, I think we should end in song, don't you? Since we started in song. <laughs> so go, long. Green Lantern. Go, Green Lantern. <laughs> right. Go, Green Lantern. Go. In brightest day and darkest night. Yes. Oh, we got to put that to music. We will do that. Would be would that not be the perfect name for a Green Lantern musical? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a plan. Green Lantern's plan. light. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, it'll do better than uh, Spider Man Into the Dark. Well, yes, one can hope. One can hope. <laughs> well, okay. well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jason, for inviting me. You're great to talk to you, man. You're great. Uh, so are you. So are you. Thanks so much. <laughs>